All right, guys, we are in chapter eight. We're going to be looking at networks of communication and exchange. Um, so we're going to be looking at the Silk Road, Indian Maritime Trade, um, the, the trade routes across Africa. So we're going to hit several different parts of the world. And the, the main thing that we're going to look at is, you know, how this opened up new cultures, new, new ideas, uh, new wealth. All of those things are going to come into play as we discuss this today. So let's start. All right, so we're going to start in the Silk Road. I'm going to start with origins and operations and then move on down. Uh, the Silk Road was an overland route that linked China to the Mediterranean world via Mesopotamia, Iran, and Central Asia. The origins of the Silk Road may be located um, in the occasional trading of Central Asian nomads. Regular, large-scale trade was fostered by the Chinese demand for Western products. This was particularly horses and by the, the, the Parthian state in northeastern Iran and its control of the markets in Mesopotamia. In addition to horses, China imported alfalfa, grapes, and a variety of other new crops, as well as medicinal products, metals, and precious stones. China exported peaches and apricot, apricot, apricots, excuse me, uh, spices, manufactured goods, including silk, pottery, and paper, silk being probably the main product for them. Nomadism in Central and East Asia, the Silk Roads depended on the nomads in Central Asia to provide animals and protection. The Scythians in the 6th century BCE were described as having huge herds, which they moved around the areas of, north, uh, of the north of the Black and Caspian Seas. They were horseback riders. They had movable felt houses and used wagons pulled by oxen. Nomads in Central Asia were self-reliant. They ate meat and milk from animals and made houses and clothes out of the wool, out of the wool furs and leather that they got. In nomadic areas, women were generally responsible for the care of the animals. Nomads relied on more uh, relied on more settled populations for metal. Scythians, for example, used metal acquired in trade to make a variety of tools and weapons for their own use. Now let's move to the, um, the Sassanid Empire and the impact of the Silk Road. So in the impact of the Silk Road down there. The Sassanid Kingdom was established in 224 and controlled the areas of Iran and Mesopotamia. Relations with the Byzantines alternated between war and peaceful trading relationships. In times of peace, the Byzantine cities of Syria and the Arab nomads who guided caravans between the Sassanid and Byzantine empires all flourished on trade. Arabs also benefited from the invention of the camel saddle, which allowed them to take control of the caravan trade. The Iranian hinterland was ruled by a largely autonomous local aristocracy that did not pose a threat, however, to the stability of the Sassanid Empire. The Sassanid Empire made Zoroastrianism its official religion, similar to how the Byzantine Empire made Christianity its official religion. Both Zoroastrianism and Christianity were tolerant of other religions. State sponsorship of Zoroastrianism and Christianity set the, a precedent for the link that developed between Islamic religion and the Islamic State. The Byzantine and Sassanid empires were characterized by state development or state involvement in theological struggles. In the third century, Mani of M A N I of Mesopotamia founded a religion whose beliefs beliefs centered around the struggle between good and evil. Mani was killed by the Sassanid Shah, but Mani Shiism, as it became known, spread widely in Central Asia. Arabs had some awareness of these religious conflicts. Uh, and knew about Christianity. During this time period, religion was replaced. Uh, re religion had replaced citizenship, language, and ethnicity as a paramount factor to people's identity. Turkic nomads, Turkic nomads who became the dominant pastoralist group in Central Asia, benefited from trade. Their elites constructed houses, lived settled lives, and became interested in foreign religions, including Christianity, Manichaeism, Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, and eventually Islam. Central, Asia military, Central Asian military technologies, particularly the stirrup, were exported both east and west, with significant consequences for the conduct of war. 
These are the Asian trade routes that we were talking about. You see the Silk Road in red. That is one of the most common, most popular, widely known uh, trade routes really in world history. So let's look at the Indian maritime system. The origins and contact of trade. The, there is evidence that er, of early trade between the ancient Mesopotamia and the Indus Valley. This trade appears to have broken off between Mesopotamia at, because Mesopotamia turned more towards trade with East Africa. 2,000 years ago, Malay sailors from Southeast Asia migrated to the islands of Madagascar. These migrants, however, did not retain communications or trade with their homeland. And so down there you see environment and technology. Um, the monsoons became an important aspect of really how these trade routes developed. Um, you know, they followed the winds. They, they didn't go through the storms. They decided to go kind of around them or, or behind them so that they didn't uh, get caught up in that type of thing. And then the Latin sails was an important technology that ended up um, kind of changing the game when it came to um, being able to, to trade via ocean long distance. Let's look at the impact of the ocean trade. What little we know about trade in the Indian Ocean system before Islam is gleaned largely from the single century uh, CE Greco-Egyptian text called the Periplus of the uh, Eurythrian, uh, Eurythrian Sea. Make sure you look that up. I know I pronounced that wrong. This account describes a trading system that must have been well established and flourishing when the account was written. The goods traded include a wide variety of spices, aromatic resins, pearls, Chinese pottery, and other luxury goods. The volume of trade was probably not as high as in the Mediterranean. The culture of the Indian, Indian Ocean ports was often isolated from that of their hinterlands. In the western part of the Indian Ocean, trading ports did not have access to large inland populations of potential consumers. Even those in eastern Indian and Malay Peninsula ports did, not, did have access to large inland. Traders and sailors in the Indian Ocean system often married local women in the ports as they frequented. These women thus became mediators between the cultures. So let's move to the early Saharan cultures. Undatable rock paintings in the highland areas that separate the southern from the northern Sahara indicate the existence of an early Saharan hunting culture that was later joined by cattle breeders who portrayed who were portrayed as looking rather like contemporary West Africans. The artwork indicates that the cattle breeders were later succeeded by horse herders who drove chariots. There is no evidence to support the earlier theory that these charioteers might have been Minoan or Mycenaean refugees. But there is also no evidence to show us that either their origins or their fate. So potentially it could be Minoan or Mycenaean or it could not be. They're just not sure. The Highland rock art indicates the camel riders followed the charioteers. The camel was introduced from Arabia and its introduction and domestication in the Sahara was probably related to the development of the trans-Saharan trade. Written evidence and the design of camel saddles and patterns of camel use indicate south to north diffusion of camel riding. The camel made it possible for people from the southern highlands of the Sahara to roam the desert and establish contacts with people of the northern Sahara. And then we're going to look at trade. Now we're going to get trade across the Sahara. Trade across the Sahara developed slowly when two local trading systems, one in southern Sahara and one in the north, were linked. Traders in the southern Sahara had access to desert salt deposits and exported salt. I was looking for you, I'm sorry. Exported salt and sub-Saharan regions in return for the koala nuts and palm oil. Roman colonists in the north exported agricultural products to Italy. In the 3rd century, CE transitions in and the decline of Rome, such as, uh, as, such as slowing, the tra slowing trade, the ad abominant of farms and growth of nomadism altered the connection that existed before. So this is a um, rock art showing, the Sahara, uh, showing that trade and, and herding did happen uh, in the Sahara. This is a great map showing you guys the uh, different areas um, 
of Africa. A lot of people lump Africa as just one whole country. It's a continent with many diverse cultures, climate, things like that. This is a South Arabian saddle, which ended up changing the game when it came to trade on camels. And later on, another saddle. All right, so let's look at Sub-Saharan Africa, challenging uh, geography first. Sub-Saharan Africa is, lar is a large area with many different environmental zones and many geological obstacles to movement. Some of the most significant ge geographical areas are the Sahel, S-A-H-E-L, the tropical savanna, the tropical rainforest of the lower Niger and Zaire, the savanna area south of the rainforest, the steppe and desert below that, and the temperate highlands of South Africa. So a very diverse um, continent, if you will. So let's look at the development of cultural unity. Scholars draw a distinction between the great traditions of the ruling elite culture in a civilization and the many small traditions of common people. That's how they kind of develop culture. In Sub-Saharan Africa, no overarching great tradition develops. Sub-Saharan Africa is a vast territory with of many small traditions. Historians know very little about the prehistory of these small traditions and their peoples. African cultures are highly diverse. The estimated 2,000 spoken languages of the continent and the numerous different food production systems reflect the diversity of the, of the African ecology and the different difficulty of communication and trade between the gr different groups. Another reason for the long dominance of small traditions is that there's no foreign powers able to conquer Africa and thus impose a unified great tradition. Now let's look at the African cultural characteristics. Despite their diversity, African cultures display certain common features that attest to an underlining cultural unity. One of these common cultural features is a concept of kingship in which kings are rich, uh, ritually isolated and oversees societies in which people are arranged in age groups and kinship divisions. Other common features include cultivation with the hoe and digging stick, digging stick in the use of rhythm in African music, and the functions of dancing and mask wearing rituals. One hypothesis offered to explain this cultural unity holds that the people of sub saharan Africa are descended from the people who occupied the southern Sahara during its wet period and migrated south to the Sahel where cultural traditions developed, and that's how it spread over time. Now the advent of iron and the Bantu migrations. Sub-Saharan African culture had its origins of the equator and then spread southward. Iron working also began north of the equator and spread southward. Linguistic evidence suggests that the spread of iron and other technology in sub-Saharan Africa was the result of the phenomenon known as the Bantu migrations. The origin or the original homeland of the Bantu people was in the area of the border of the modern Niger and Cameroon. Evidence suggests that Bantu people spread out toward the east and south through a series of migrations over a period of the first millennium CE. So then let's talk about the spread of ideas. It is extremely difficult, sometimes impossible, to trace the dissemination of ideas in pre-literate societies. For example, eating pork was restricted or prohibited by religious belief in Southeast Asia in ancient Egypt and in eastern Iran. Because Southeast Asia was an early center of pig domestication, scholars hypothesized that the pig and the religious injunctions concerning eating the pig traveled together toward the west. This has not been proven. Another difficult problem involves the invention of coins. In the Mediterranean world, the coins were invented in Anatolia and spread and spread from there to Europe, North Africa, and India. Chinese made cast copper coins. Was this inspired by the Anatolian example? There's really no way of knowing. So let's look at the spread of Buddhism. The spread of ideas in a deliberate and organized fashion such that we can trace it is a phenomenon to the first millennium CE. This is particularly the case with the spread of Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam. The spread of Buddhism was facilitated by the royal sponsorship and by the travels of ordinary pilgrims and missionaries. In India, the Marianan king Ashoka and king Kanishka of the Kushans actively supported Buddhism. Two of the most well-known pilgrims who helped transmit Buddhism to China were the Chinese monks Fayan and Yangsheng. 
Both have left reliable narrative accounts of their journeys. The Buddhist missionaries from India traveled to a variety of destinations, west to Syria, Egypt, and Mesopotamia, as well as Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia, and Tibet. Buddhism was changed and further developed in the lands to which it spread. Theravada Buddhism became dominant in Sri Lanka, Mahayana in Tibet, and then Chang Zen in East Asia. So let's look at the spread of Christianity. Armenian, uh, Armenia was an important uh, interpol for Silk Road trade. Mediterranean states spread Christianity to Armenia to bring that kingdom to its side and thus deprive Iran the control of this area. The transmission of Christianity to Ethiopia was similarly linked to the Mediterranean Christian attempt to deprive Iran of trade. So if you can tell there, um, the trade routes became not just important for building a world economy or a transcontinental economy, it also became important with spreading some, some uh, topics that we've already discussed like religion, agriculture, and things like that. Guys, if